Hello. Uh, today we're here with uh, Susan Kartsonis, a uh, producer and executive and co-founder of and partner in Resonate Entertainment, a media company that focuses on films for female audiences that are inclusive. Um, she's published, uh, published, and you can tell I'm, you tell where my focus is. She has produced, that's going to be one of the things we're talking about. What is, what is this producing and publishing? She's produced popular uh, hits, including What Women Want, uh, the second, uh, second highest grossing romantic comedy of all time, and the top grossing romantic comedy at the time of its release, as well as other popular films that include Where the Heart Is and No Reservations. She's a member of the Motion Picture, Picture Academy, the Television Academy, and the Producers Guild, and serves on the board of the Merrill Street founded The Writers Lab, uh, the board of the nonprofit Screenwriters and Workshop Cine Story, and teaches producing at USC, as well as um, acting as an advisor uh, to the Wilkes University Creative Writing, Maslow Family Creative Writing Program. Welcome, Susan. Thank you, Phil. Good to see you. Uh, nice to see you too. Um, of course, we're doing this in Luton. Normally, we do this at the, the Wilkes residency itself, and, and Susan has been kind enough in the past to uh, work with some of our students, and we hope to continue that uh, this uh, residency. Um, <clears throat> we were chatting before, Susan, a little bit about uh, what a producer does, and I think that's a that's a mystery. To many of us, uh, we all have heard of producers, but we don't know exactly what they do. Why don't you tell us a little bit about what a producer does? Well, I like to think about a producer as being like um, the caulking in a bathroom. Um, if, if we're there and everything's running smoothly, nobody notices us or even realizes <laughs> we're there. But if, if we're not there, everything falls apart and it's really messy and horrible and you wouldn't want to be there. So um, basically the technical definition is we're the enabling force, using the word enabling in the way it was originally intended, which is <laughs> make things happen. We do tend to like caulking sort of slip into the places where there are gaps or problems and solve those problems. And those problems can be um, creative, contractual, human, financial or distribution problems. Um, we wear a lot of different hats and there are producers who have different specialties. A producer who deals in the nuts and bolts and the union contracts in great detail is often called a line producer or a unit production manager. A creative producer is often involved in the inception of the rights and is the person who um, shepherds the project from the very inception. For example, What Women Want was a one-line concept when I heard it for the first time. And all the way through the development of that project with the writer or writers and the uh, realization of that project with the director and finding the financing of that project or the right financing partners and then bringing it to the public and the way that it's presented complete with marketing materials. So the creative producer is often the person who's in charge of that. You also hear a lot about independent producers. Independent producers are people who often work um, outside of the big corporate systems and create their own infrastructure. So if you were to make a movie with one of the big studios, the names you know, like um, Disney or Warner Brothers or Sony or Universal, all the, the, the things that you need exist within that studio, all the departments. There's a marketing department, a distribution department, there's a legal department that provides all legal um, processes. There's even uh, their creative executives who help you um, develop the script so that it's in line with what the marketing needs of the um, company are. And, and most importantly, they're a bank. They have money to invest in the project and make it go forward from inception through completion. An independent producer gathers all of the elements I just mentioned independently. The independent producer finds a financier who will take that one line idea 
and, and invest money so that it can be turned into a screenplay and attract a director and attract stars and then puts together the production monies that allow the millions of dollars, um, usually it, even on an independent production, a movie will be um, at least a million dollars and, and sometimes as much as $20 million if it's a big independent production, but gathers all of those resources and then eventually brings the project to market and finds a distributor. Sometimes that distributor is found early in the process. Sometimes it's found after the movie's been made and all the financiers have gone out on a limb and it's brought to a film festival where it's then acquired for distribution. So that's my, you know, thumbnail sketch of all the different producer aspects. But we do everything, including persuading um, an unhappy star to come out of the trailer and get to set because <laughs> Every hour on a $20 million film is, you know, at least um, $10,000, you know, and possibly more, depending on what equipment you've rented for the day. Um, and so any time wasted is, is a cost. Or it could be um, grappling a story problem or a character problem with a writer and tossing around ideas and, you um, thinking about things or finding research um, that will inspire the writer. Um, and it could be saying that you hate a uh, one sheet, otherwise known as a poster, a movie poster, and think that the movie poster should emphasize another element of the movie or that a movie trailer gives too much away which is something producers often complain about. And it's mostly not true because audiences want to know what the movie's about, but that's another conversation for another day. So anyway, I've gone on and on. <laughs> no, that's, it's fascinating because I mean, the thing that comes across is the amazing variety of things that you have to know and, and kinds of things. You know, I, I oftentimes tell, uh, tell students who are in publishing, I say, you know, you have really, a lot of people who are writers and who approach publishing from the writing aspect and they bring their creativity to it. Um, but you don't have that many people who are both interested in the creative uh, aspect and then also have some technical skills to, to do some of those things in publishing that you're talking about. And if people could develop those, the variety of skills, it makes them much more valuable. And it sounds like that's what a producer has to be. You definitely have to be a left brain, right brain person, meaning logical on the left side and creative on the right side in order to do the job well. Um, and I'm very, very grateful. I have a master's in dramatic writing and I'm so happy that I went down that path. Um, and I also have a really deep love of organization and um, figuring out how to solve problems, creative problem solving, which is a huge part of the producing skill set. So yeah, you need to you need to have a love for um, for both left and right brain activities. You also need to be someone who enjoys challenges, uh, enjoys pivoting. Um, enjoys surprises and isn't thrown and made crazy by surprises because every day is a surprise and every movie is just a series of problems to be solved. Team building is a huge part of things. People skills um, are a huge asset. And um, also, I think with producing, for me, I'm very, very easily bored and I'm never bored when I'm producing mm. because there's <laughs> always something to do that's not boring. There's some boring things that you have to do. And generally I like to delegate them. It's a, <laughs> a delegator and somebody who finds good partners who like to do those things you don't like to do, but um, it's never boring. It's never really boring because you delve into different worlds as you tell different stories. So you get to take a deep dive into an an area that you probably haven't geographically lived in or interpersonally lived in and, and get a chance to feel like what it is to live that life or live that story. And you do that for, you know, at least a, a year to a year and a half on any given project. And that's a lot of fun. It keeps life interesting. How did you become a producer, Susan? 
Well, I am the oldest of five kids and I'm the oldest girl. And anybody from a big family who's the oldest girl already knows what I'm going to say. But <laughs> you are responsible as an oldest girl often for making sure dinner's on the table, that people are organized, you become, if you're not from a super wealthy family, and perhaps even if you are, kind of a unofficial uh, nanny, camp counselor, organizer, producer. And from the time I was very, very young, I was organizing the family. I was cooking meals. I was getting people, you know, ready to do things. And I was also telling stories to my little brothers. So uh, it kind of goes along with birth order for me. That's where I developed a lot of my executive skills. And then the creative skills I have were honed along the way. I made a film when I was 12 years old that won a an award. I was inspired by a teacher of mine in a little tiny Arizona town that had no business making films, but I had a really creative teacher named Annalee Emery who decided that we were going to make movies that year. And I made a movie that won first prize at the Arizona State University Film Festival. And wow. I, I, I was bitten by the by the bug before that. I, I'd been writing plays and performing in them, and I basically decided I wanted to be Shakespeare. But my father, who was a very, very creative man, he was an architect and urban planner, um, said to me, you don't want to be in theater, Susan. You want to think about film. Film is the future. And I said, no, it isn't. Theater is where it's at. That's, <laughs> that's where you need to be if you want to feel what the audience feels. And I, I do believe that to this day, that you need to put films in front of people and gauge their reactions, because it tells you a lot as a filmmaker. But he was right. And um, I, um, I studied theater as an undergrad, and I studied screenwriting as a graduate student, and I worked in the industry in between and got the lay of the land. I worked at a a small boutique talent agency and kind of learned the way the industry is laid out. That's a really good place to learn because you're, you're working for the people who sell. So you're wedged right between the buyers and the creators hmm. and you see what that relationship is and the way they interact. And you get a sense of kind of what you might want to do and where you fit in. And I knew right away that I love to write. I didn't know if I had the patience to sit with a blank page, but I loved writers and I loved interacting with writers. And I remember um, the lit agent that I worked for represented an incarcerated African-American man named Wilbert Rideau, who um, was the, he was a poet and an essayist and he was, he, he had founded a literary journal in the prison where he was incarcerated, I think in Louisiana. And I was really inspired by my conversations with him. I thought, this is a man who's been in prison since he was 18 years old mm -hmm. and he is still, he is still creating. And I, I, wanted to, I wanted to work with people who were telling stories because stories transcend any sort of immediate circumstance you might be, you know, faced with, and uh, Wilbur Rideau was faced with a long-term incarceration. And, um, you know, on the other side of the spectrum, the, the, the more privileged writers who I was dealing with in Hollywood working for this literary agent were so much fun and had um, so many really great ideas and were, um, just a joy to talk to and to sort of trade barbs with. I thought, I want to work with writers. How can I do that? And I thought, in order to really speak to writers well and to meet them at their level, I need to study writing. So I kind of laid out a course of study for myself, which was that I was going to go to writing school. I was going to go to graduate school to study writing so that I could better work with writers. And I, I think in the back of my head, I thought I might write again too, or continue to, to write. But the more important thing to me was to be able to communicate well with writers. So that's what I did. Um, 
And that led to an internship um, reading screenplays and manuscripts for 20th Century Fox, which then had an office in New York City because I went to grad school at NYU. And um, within about nine months of starting to read scripts, um, Scott Rudin, who was then an executive, a very young executive um, at 20th Century Fox, asked me if I would move to LA and I kind of didn't want to move back to LA. I'd gone to school undergraduate there. So I negotiated my first deal uh, and I said, I'm really happy here in New York. Um, I'll come to LA if you make me an executive. And he said, okay, I'll make you an executive. Just get out here. Cause he needed help. He, he had a very small staff. So I jumped on a plane. I used my American express card. Um, I didn't even have money to buy groceries. I remember I found Trader Joe's was the only grocery at the time that would take credit cards. <laughs> so I, uh, I, I parked my groceries on a credit card. I told my boyfriend who was living in our apartment, pack up our stuff and follow me, you know, as soon as you can. He was a screenwriter, so he was happy to follow. And uh, I started my job at 20th Century Fox. I spent 10 years at Fox. I supervised about 20 movies. Some of those movies include um, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, which spawned the television show. Um, I acquired French Kiss with Meg Ryan. Um, I oversaw Truth About Cats and Dogs, For the Boys, starring Bette Midler, Dying Young, starring Julia Roberts, um, Nell, starring Jodie Foster. And I built a lot of relationships along the way. Um, I, oh, I did a little a movie for little boys called Rookie of the Year that I particularly loved making. Um, a lot, a lot of movies. And um, it was a huge learning experience. I learned about what to do and what not to do um, in terms of managing projects, where money gets wasted, um, it, interpersonal kind of political things. I forged such strong relationships with agents and with um, writers and with colleagues that have really followed me and lasted me my entire career. And it was an amazing, amazing experience. And at the end of that 10 years, I really felt like there were people who were doing better as executives who were not so into the detail as I was. They were able to let go of things and allow people just to do their job. Whereas I wanted to roll up my sleeves and get more embedded in the making of movies. I wanted to have more of an imprint on those movies. And so I took a job building a film company for some TV creators. And um, during that time, um, I was at the Disney studios with a well-financed deal. And I was able to make What Women Want and Where the Heart Is, which was a newly published, it was actually an unpublished book when I received it at 20th Century Fox. It had kind of sat there and I was able to bring it over to my new company. And I convinced Lowell Gans and Babalu Mandel who wrote the movie Splash. And um, I think they wrote also League of Our Own and a, a lot of classic, brilliant comedies. I was able to convince them to adapt the book and Billy Letts, who was the author of the book, and she's she also was the mother of the playwright Tracy Letts. Um, she had that was her first book that she published. It hadn't gotten much notoriety, but I was able to convince my friend at Oprah's company to get Oprah to consider it for her book club. Oprah chose it for her book club and it became a huge bestseller. It really changed Billy's life. Billy's no longer with us, sadly, but um, it was um, it, it was something that I feel really good about having done because not only did it help the movie where the heart is, it helped publicize the movie, but it really changed this author's life and made her very, very financially um, stable. And um, I met her huge rollicking um, Oklahoma family, which you sort of know the dark side of from Osage County, Tracy Let's Play, but they were a delight. And um, as is Tracy, he's so brilliantly talented. So these are some of the people you meet along the way, you know, along with movie stars like Jodie Foster and Bette Midler and Julia Roberts. And I, I worked with Sean Connery on a 
on a potential remake of Ghost and Mrs. Mirror that never really came to fruition, but it was a lot of fun developing it and, um, and more and more and more. So I spent 10, 10 years there at, at Fox. I went to this um, other company and built it, uh, built the film division there and made um, those two movies plus um, inherited had developed and inherited a movie called Mistress of Spices, which I made with my friend Gurinder Chadha. Uh, it stars Ashwarya Rai. It's a huge uh, Bollywood movie star. Um, and uh, that was a really great experience. I was able to do that once I became an independent producer. Then um, when that company that I'd been working for decided to shut its doors, um, for, for a period of time, and there was no longer a job for me or my staff, I, I started an independent production company called Storefront Pictures. And I realized that there was um, a huge audience. I'd always known this. The female audience had been virtually ignored by Hollywood because all the decisions were being made by male executives. And so often the business decisions in Hollywood are made in a visceral way rather than based on numbers or metrics. And so I thought, God, if you could make an independent company that focuses on that perspective, I know those movies would do well because I knew the movies I'd made, which mostly it had female protagonists, um, had done really, really well. Or they were at least for the female audience. I, I like to say I'd make movies that men want to see and uh, that, that women want to see and men like too. Oh. And, uh, because I like to be inclusive of everybody. So anyway, that um, in 2002, I started Storefront Pictures and I made a series of movies over the year. The years I started with a kid's movie called Aquamarine, which 20th Century Fox invited me in to produce. Um, the director was a first time female director. We went to Australia. I spent the better part of the year in Australia. See, you can never get bored when you... <laughs> travel like that it was a remarkable experience with a lot of visual effects it starred emma roberts and jojo um the big pop superstar um and um it was just um it was a really delightful experience i was bitten by the bug um and made a bunch of other movies i'm like just this is a long run-on sentence um but during that period of independent production i also made um no reservations. I also made um, uh, a bunch of other movies that I was asked to come on now as an experienced producer to help bolster the production in some way. And um, so my producing career has evolved and changed. I both develop original material and sometimes I'm asked to come be a kind of additive producer, which I like to do only if I can be helpful. I don't want to be butting in on somebody else's movie because I wouldn't like that to happen to me. Wow, what a story. I mean, the thing that comes across so much, Susan, is that this magical combination of flexibility, so to speak, you know, willing, willingness to do what needs to be done, and at the same time, maintaining some kind of thematic mission. You yeah. know, the idea of finding that audience and also advancing a cultural movement, perhaps through film, uh, to do both of those. You know, some people I think wind up doing one thing, uh, for instance, small poetry presses, you know, <laughs> we don't really necessarily find our audience, but we're, 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 we're surely gonna drill down to the 17 or 22 people who read our books, but, um, but to do both those things. And the fact that you began, it sounds like your professional career, exactly where you're now uh, mentoring some of the students that we have at, at Wilkes uh, as readers of scripts. Um, and, and the, you know, that they've been called coverages. And just, I'm, I am absolutely fascinated by that process because it's so different from what happens in the literary world. You know, we receive all of these unsolicited manuscripts. There's no money involved. So the people, we don't even know who the writers are. They're, they're internationally unknown. And every manuscript that comes across the transom, for the most part, you know, you read it, you read up until the point 
where you're not going to take it. And sometimes that comes very, very quickly uh, because just it's logistics. You know, you can't follow through and you make mistakes. And, and that was actually for me as a reader, one of the first things to realize it's okay to make mistakes. You know, as a, as a teacher, you don't want to be making mistakes. You don't want to be unfair. Hey, Phil, I, I passed on a handmaid's tale. <laughs> I felt like it was too dark for uh, the times in 1986, but now I think it's right in line with the, what we're going. Through. Sadly, we've we've darkened to to make it uh, to to make it relevant. Yes. Oh my goodness. Um, and, and so, but these coverages that the students at, at Wilkes have done, and, and I assume the same kind of reading you were doing, are so different because they're they're so in depth. I mean, you, you know, these, these are page after page of questions, analysis, uh, you know, suggestions like that. And I, and I guess this is, a, you know, you were able to uh, learn all those skills starting there where these students are going to be starting. Um, and my question is, just logistically, how do you manage to filter the uh, submissions that you get so that you can afford to assign people to do long coverages of these of these submissions? Well, you know, there are a fair number that come over the transom, although technically we don't accept anything that's unsolicited. Okay. But sometimes somebody will um, write a, a, a particularly persuasive email or letter that shows that they've done their research on my company, on me, that it's thoughtful, it's considerate, it, sh it shows a certain kind of character um, and intelligence, even in a brief mm -hmm. note. And I follow my instincts about that and I'll communicate back to them. And if, it, if the back and forth continues to feel right, then I might have them sign some legal paperwork or, or have them find somebody to submit through, which affords them and me some legal protection about, you know, the submission. And um, so that's the, the first step. Uh, often I receive scripts through agents and managers and um, friends, you know, who know what my taste is. Um, sometimes I, I'm a mentor in um, several different programs. Sometimes scripts come to me that way. I mean, I optioned a script that um, came out of Wilkes. Um, and uh, you never know where a good writer is going to come from and where a good idea is going to come from. But like you, I read a certain amount and sometimes the writing tells me very quickly that this storyteller either doesn't have a grasp on the story or doesn't quite have the craft yet, or this story is just not for me. And in that case, I'm able to, um, I won't read all the way to the end because I have to be really protective about my time. My time is my precious capital and I have to guard that. I also have people who read for me so if I know something is particularly promising, I might actually have them read it be before I read it or simultaneously with me reading it because I know I'll probably want to share the information about it and I might not have time to write that coverage myself. And coverage is basically a log line that encapsulates what the story is in terms of genre, in terms of tone, in terms of plot, in terms of characters. So it's one or two sentences that does that. And then a synopsis, which might be anywhere from a very long paragraph to a page and a half to sometimes with detailed coverage, like three or four pages or five pages, and then a comment, a critical comment. So um, that, that um, tells you how promising for film or television the premise is, how promising the storytelling is of the plot and the way it unfolds the characters and what the general character of the writing is. Is it really strong literary writing? Because sometimes good literary writing exists in a screenplay. And sometimes the writing is fairly uh, straightforward and not very 
fancy and yet manages to be visual and dynamic and works for screen. Uh, screenwriting does not have to be literary in order to be successful, but the, the storytelling does. Mm. So it's an interesting, um, it's an interesting kind of thing. I personally enjoy a more literary experience. I like mm. it to be succinct like poetry. I like the words. I don't like the overuse of adjectives or the overabundance of words in the narrative description. I, I like the characters to define themselves through their actions as opposed to the narrator telling me too much about them in ways that I, I know we can't possibly show on the screen. So, um, but it's, um, it's interesting the the process of coverage and the the skills that uh, a really great um, reader can bring to the table and the way that they can impart what that story is and ideally somebody who does coverage understands the uh, goals of the person they're reading for um, understands whether that person has an appetite for developing a story further if the writer is talented or whether if the idea is not well developed, they should just, you know, let it go. Um, and has an appreciation for good writing, good screenwriting specifically. Um, sometimes readers read novels, uh, unpublished and published, and it's nice if they have a sense of what makes that writing good. And also sometimes if that um, author has potential as a screenwriter because they think in a filmic way. Uh, Stephen King is somebody who thinks in a really filmic way and has written screenplays there. Um, Michael Crichton wrote screenplays. Um, there are many, many authors who are very capable uh, screenwriters and who have a kind of um, knowledge of craft before actually having done it because of the way that they tell stories. There are other writers who have to learn that craft and have to make that um, that transition um, to be able to do so because it is a different kind of writing. You can't go down rabbit holes or tangents. You can't go deeply into somebody's mind without figuring out a visual way of telling the story of the descent into that mind. So it's it's a it's a very different um, craft, but it is it's interesting and and somebody who's reading scripts needs to have a, a sense of what good writing is about and an appreciation for it and kind of an enthusiasm because even if your job is to say no you sh I, I think as a reader i started as a reader and i have a real appreciation for the craft of of, of reading just a, a kind of enthusiasm for storytelling and uh, a sense of wanting to help that story get told, even if this person who you're presenting the coverage to is not ultimately going to be the person who does it. You know, how could you make this into a good movie? What would you have to do, you know, for this to work? Where did they um, kind of fail, but where did they have something really special about it? Just like with any critique, you kind of want to find what what's promising, what's good, what has potential in it, and what maybe it's fatal flaw or maybe a fixable flaw. Susan Carsonis, thank you so much for this really revealing and penetrating discussion. And thank you for your mentorship of the students uh, with, who, are, who are beginning and they'll see now beginning where you once began your professional career as, as a reader. Um, thank you, Susan. Thank you, Phil, for letting me talk so much. <laughs>